Alright guys, so today I'm talking about my attempt at um, identifying reasoning through writing and seeing student growth through writing, and my idea was using evidence in the social studies classroom. Um, I wanted to go through my objectives. By the end of this presentation, you're going to know how I attempted to help students grow in their writing, um, what worked and what didn't work, what I would have done similarly or differently if I were to redo this instructional sequence, and what I'll do in the future as a result of this experience. And it was an experience in many ways. This uh, school and the students, the school was Bayside High School, as I like to call it. Um, overall, it's a high SES. Um, I personally taught three honors courses. I taught them in one college level course, which was the basic level course of the school. Um, European imperialism through World War II. And you're going to see that in a lot of the prompts. Um, I chose two students, Timmy and Mary. Uh, Timmy is student A, Mary is student B. Um, they are pretty much similar in all aspects, including their extracurricular activities. The only exception is being their gender, um, which is something that I wanted to look at in this. Um, these writing assignments were given only to the honors level courses um, as well. And so the instructional goal here, like I've already said, is using evidence. By using comparison with material covered in class, I was looking for two sort of things here. I wanted students to compare and use what they've learned in class when writing. A lot of these writing prompts you will see deal a lot with current events or current happenings, at least the first two do. Um, and I wanted them to deepen their writing through the use of examples besides what is just simply being discussed. Um, I also wanted them, at the, by the end, we phased into this, this idea of citing information found in outside sources, outside materials. Um, first assignment, part one, this goes through SOL Standard War History 2, 8, C, and D, and this deals with nationalism, particularly this one is with Italy and Germany. Um, around this time, I decided, um, I threw this, this is kind of thrown together as a simple prompt there. We are dealing with uh, Egypt. Egypt had just um, had a regime change, and the, the Libyan crisis had just started. And I wanted students to look and find the current article about these revolutions, as I said. And I wanted them to tell me what it says, how you feel about it, and where you see nationalism in it. And I kind of hinted at this idea of using comparisons in classroom material. Um, this also, and you'll see all of the, um, all of the prompts deal with the NC NCSS themes of individuals, groups, and institutions, as well as power, authority, and governance. They all have a lot to do with how the government is treating their people. And so how it turned out, and there's an um, example here afterwards, both were written really well. Uh, Timmy, and it'll kind of show up here, needs to do more proofreading. Uh, proofreading, I told him that he needs to sleep on it and come back to it the next day. It seemed very rushed. Um, neither fully accomplished the process goal. Um, Mary used a slight comparison with classroom material, but really didn't talk about anything in class besides what the prompt was. And better, more clear prompt is really what I would do differently here. Um, it was thrown together, like I said, and I did not ask students to cite their sources here. I wanted to see what they were going to do. A few students did, uh, but these were examples that did not. Um, a lot of this was verbal um, explanation of the prompt. Um, how I supported student writing this? I gave simple feedback, and I took the feedback, and I took what I got out of this to create the second prompt. And the second prompt here, or before that, Timmy needs to show his work. He gets very repetitive, and this is an idea of, of proofreading. He really says the same thing here when he's talking about his personal feelings about how the U.S. should, uh, whether the U.S. should intervene or not in uh, Libya. And here she's talking about Yemen, the, the issues in Yemen, and she talks about people who've been revolting uh, against their governments for hundreds of years, but she doesn't even remotely talk about what we have discussed in class. And so we come to the second prompt here. Um, World History 2, uh, 211C, and this deals with the rise of the dictators and the rise of the totalitarians. And I asked students here to compare present-day totalitarianism in Libya and North Korea or another example that they could find with that of Hitler, Mussolini, or Stalin. Um, I gave students some possible sources. I think I gave them five, and I gave them a list of five different characteristics such as control of the media, um, strong central leader, um, cult of personality was even one of them. And students were given a full week for this assignment to complete it. Um, and they were given a, uh, a prompt as well. How it turned out, Timmy cited and quoted, you'll see this here. Um, here's an example of him using um, the ideas of Stalin and Mussolini in his um, writings in order to um, back his point of 
um, Gaddafi being a totalitarian. Um, Mary uses multiple sources. She cites the sources at the end of the at the end, but she doesn't really use it. She uses very little comparison, and she uses very little citing inside of her um, her essay itself. What I would have done differently, I think I've been more firm in my prompting grading on citation and comparison. Um, and one thing you're going to see, and one theme that runs throughout this is uh, a reflection on this is that a rubric is worth a thousand words. Um, is one of the kind of things that have come out of this knowing. Um, but some examples here, and you can see um, this is Timmy's. Um, and you can see here Timmy here directly quoting and giving a citation, not necessarily a parenthetical citation, but a citation within explaining his ideas. And also even here using this idea of Hitler's hatred of the Jews and the racial cleansing in comparison with how Gaddafi expelled the, um, the Italians out of Libya when he came to power. Um, there's a check mark here, a lot of the things that show up very well. Um, and then finally in part three, it's a simple prompt, compare and contrast the Bosnian and Cambodian genocides. This was covered in class the previous day, and students were given two articles, so they had all of the information that they were to use. And so, and they were also given a, um, didn't make it up there, they were given a graphic organizer, which you'll see here actually in a second. Um, they were given a graphic organizer to complete and then to write. Uh, students were given the class period to write a complete five-paragraph essay. This changed to a three-body paragraph, to just the three-body par body paragraphs after the first period. Um, how it turned out, both used their organizers, but maybe not to the level that I had hoped. Um, time became a major issue in Timmy's class, allowing him only to complete his introduction to two and a half body paragraphs, which was uh, very light. He used very little citation in his essay. Mary used detailed citation and finished two body paragraphs and a thesis statement. Um, some of her thoughts over were kind of jumbled. Um, what I would have done differently, I think I would have shortened the assignment or given the, the assignment for homework to be completed. Um, and then also this idea of a rubric for grading again um, becomes a major issue um, when I'm looking back. And here's an example of Timmy's writing. And you can see here he actually uses a parenthetical citation here and uses quotes. Um, and I would show you the, um, the PDF of Mary's did not show up very well. Um, and I'm going to have to go back and redo that, but you can see here um, he's using uh, these citations, and he does not use it that well in this, and that potentially could be because of a time issue. Um, he was very stressed while I was in class. Um, here's the graphic organizer, as I was describing to you. Um, I allow them to create their characteristics um, to decide what they wanted to uh, compare and contrast with. So he chose ethnic diversity, which he contrasted communism and the ultimate goal of genocide. Um, Neither of them use it fully. They didn't really put citations in it, which I did not actually even tell them that was a verbal command um, that I gave afterwards. Reflections on the whole process. Um, a good prompt is worth a million dollars. Um, something that I'm really learning is um, if you expect a kid, if you expect your students, rather, to, um, to write what you want them to write, you need to tell them explicitly what you're going to write. Um, what you want them to do. And that can be done through a prompt or a rubric, and a rubric is worth a thousand words, at least a consistent grading. Looking back on a lot of the papers, I found that uh, there are grammatical errors that I could and should have probably seen and probably have corrected, even if that had not gone into the actual grading portion. Uh, did the difference in the papers come from my prejudice towards the gender? Did Timmy do better due to my more verbal nature of the prompts because of definitely with the first one, the quickness of the prompt, and then as we led on, perhaps trying to get into more detail but not putting it into the prompt itself. Um, how much do we need to teach literacy of all types in the social studies classroom? Um, and this kind of comes in this idea of what's going to happen next. And I'll talk about that, what I believe would have happened next for both of these students. And more in class discussion about the importance of using and citing information. Um, next for these students, Timmy, he needs to learn to proofread uh, his work better or proofread at all. Um, in um, it's the in-class writing for both of them was actually better written than uh, most of the typed things, which I found interesting. And then Mary needs to learn to complete every aspect of a prompt. Um, she left a lot of things out in each time. Um, for both of them, I believe that a, uh, a writing workshop on where, why, and how to use citations and possibly an in-depth research project with a large portion of the grade coming from the citations and coming from the use of evidence um, is where I would get. And so, um, 
as I've said, it's, it was a complete learning experience for me, really looking at these things and trying to figure out how it was going to work. Um, and so I've really learned, like I've said, I've learned a lot about rubrics. I've learned a lot about how prompts should work um, and how they don't work. But um, now I just wanted to open it up. Does anybody have any questions about the instructional secrets, what I would, what I would change about my prompts or anything else in general? A couple of questions. First question for me, and these are brief, are, why do it in class? Why, why change the condition each time? Why did the last one do the last one in class, and then why change it up from a from a five paragraph to a, a, a you know body. yeah? In the, the the major issue there was completion, um, and I wanted to have some form of completed idea um, and completed uh, prompt, even if it wasn't what I originally had hoped. Um, which was the five paragraph. Okay, was, so so go back then for that one. So why do it in class when you gave the other one for homework? Um, the goal there was that um, their test was coming up recently um, and to have given them that and they also had a very extended study guide because you will see when I'm talking about my digital humanities project that they had done a very large collective amount of work um, at home right before this. Okay. Um, and I believe that with the background information that they had received the day before, that they would be able to quickly go through these um, and be able to quickly come through. And actually, I would say that I would, 80 to 85 percent, I would say that at least four out of five students finished what they were uh, given. And these are actually the two students that I have chosen um, did not finish um, before this. But most of the students actually did finish, even the five paragraph, I would say, 50%, half the class finished the five paragraphs. Um, but knowing the students in the classes, that first class works a lot more diligently than the other two classes, even though the other two classes, I believe, are um, always test better and always do better in terms of grading um, and uh, in terms of their scores. Okay. And then the final question is, you keep saying a rubric's worth a thousand words. Uh, can you explain why you didn't do a rubric at all? Over these I'll three be honest, it, it did not even cross my mind when I was doing this, um, and that's a major regret of mine when I'm looking at what I, what could have happened when I had I used a rubric, um, because I, I really see a lot of possibilities in terms of being able to show specifically you did not use evidence, you did not do as I had said. Um, with the first one, it was a bit more of the rush thing, and then as we moved on into the other ones, it became this. Um, it. it it got left to the wayside, and this reflection on it made me realize just how important that rubric really is um, when students are writing. So, what's it important for? After effect, modeling, or how, how do you use the rubric? I think it's a I think I think it's a combination of modeling because I think you can use a rubric even before they write. Um, I think you can use a rubric, and you can show them a rubric, and you can show them a sample, and say, "Here are here's a sample, and here's how it did on the rubric." You can see here, you can see here, and so they can actually see where it's used, but it's also useful for after, for when students write, and you can point out, it's like, this deals with rubric point number three, this deals with rubric point number four, you don't have a number two, whereas, whereas um, effective use of evidence, whereas your citation, and that sort of thing. So it, I think it has two effects. Um, but. Thank you.